Good morning, my friends. Let's explore the 42nd chapter of the Tao Te Ching. So as not to miss the forest for the trees, we'll begin with a brief overview of the chapter. The Tao gives birth to one. One gives birth to two. Two gives birth to three. Three gives birth to all things. And of course, this is an overview, but this bit right here is tricky to pronounce because they're, those two words have two different meanings and two different smell, spellings, but they, they, they sound the same. And I assure you, one does not give birth to a ballet garment. Okay, let's continue. Three gives birth to all things. All things have their backs to the female and stand facing the male. When male and female combine, all things achieve harmony. Ordinary men hate solitude, but the sage makes use of it. Embracing his aloneness, realizing he is one with the whole universe. And that is the end of the chapter. Now that we have an idea where this goes, let's dig a little deeper. The Tao gives birth to one. What is this one referred to here? A common theme in, found in the Tao Te Ching is the void. Not the literal void, but the metaphor of not of non-graspability of things appearing as if almost from nowhere. Let's continue. One gives birth to two. A second, a second frequently observed theme in the 81 chapter book of the Tao Te Ching is male and female, patriarchy and matriarchy, young, and yin. The two give birth to three. Three, in once again, in the overarching context of the entire book, typically refers to the three treasures that come from not only practicing but also mastering the Tao. Those three treasures, by way of, of review, are simplicity, patience, and compassion. So we've established an interrelationship between the void, yin and yang, and the fruits of spiritual practice. Now we're going to play a bit of a closer attention to that second one, yin and yang. And by the way, it can be helpful at times to remember that Chinese is a highly symbolic language. And so short, simple, monosyllabic words are cobbled together to form complex ideas, which in itself is no mean feat. Yang and yin do not have mystical properties. They simply mean man and woman. It was understand in a culture that language is highly metaphoric highly symbolic. Sadly, in the West, we often lose sight of that. Let's turn the page. All things have their backs to the female and stand facing the male. And, and passage after passage, as we move from cover to cover through the Tao Te Ching, we see the path of Yang warned against whereas the path of yin is lauded 
embraced, and we are encouraged to emulate it and apply it gently, yet thoroughly. There is something, according to this book, treacherous, dangerous, and destructive about the male pattern, the aggressive, patriarchal manner of doing things. And as such, we are to treat that set of behaviors and attitudes as a dangerous adversary, perhaps like an angry drunk wielding a knife that we want to keep our eyes on. And as we are facing a dangerous adversary, we want our allies close behind us. In the West, we often use the phrase, especially in the last 10 years or so, my homie has my back. My friend has my back. And so we have at our back where we are the most vulnerable, protecting our flank, yin, the entire set of strategies that fall under the heading of yin or matriarchy. And so in this sentence, we are told, do not, we are, it is inferred that we're not to foolishly turn our back, turn a blind eye to yang. Yang lives in potentiality within us, within all beings and within all societal and especially institutional constructs. If you um, are well educated in some of the um, sociology uh, that has been bantied about for the last half century or so, there's the idea of institutional mm -hmm. violence, institutional racism, institutional sexism. These things are part and parcel of the patriarchal path. They are the adversaries, adversaries not only to individual well-being, the, but the collective well-being, not only of our entire species, but the, in all the ecosystems surrounding Earth. Let's turn the page. When male and female combine, all things achieve harmony. Now, many people take this one sentence, they tear it out of the Tao Te Ching and pretend that this is the only thing the Tao Te Ching says. However, so, and so they conclude that the purpose of the, of the path is to balance our yin and yang energies. But when we interpret this through the lens of all 81 chapters of the Tao Te Ching, then this has an entirely different meaning. Within each of us, we have yin impulses and we have yang impulses. Good old Carl Gustav Jung cautioned us that the only way we can overcome the shadow self is, wait for it, to be aware of our shadow self. We must be, we must practice the type of awareness, the type of passive mindfulness that is so vulnerable that it, it drops its defense mechanisms and allows itself to perceive its, even its darkest, most embarrassing, most destructive impulses, not for the purpose of indulging it because that would be all kinds of stupid, but for the, because awareness of our shadow self is I, our shadow self, like a ninja, does the most damage to ourselves and to others when we are unaware of its machinations. Like a great lion, 
without teeth or without claws. It is far less deadly when we are aware of it. Now, don't be deceived. A toothless, uh, clawless lion can still kill you, if not maim you. It's strong, fast, and heavy. But it is far less lethal without its fangs or its claws. Likewise, young impulses are destructive but far less destructive when we are aware with them. Now, here's the question. Once we have identified a destructive young impulse and we've chosen not to indulge it, how do we deal with it? The great irony is people often use young strategies in the hopes of overcoming young, which makes about as much sense as making love in the name of virginity. Now, don't get me wrong, making love in the name of virginity is a lot of fun, yet not very productive. Likewise, using scatteredness, using contrivance, using coerciveness, using force to overcome scatteredness and contrivance and coerciveness and force does not work. We must embrace a yin strategy with yin momentum and yin sensibility to deal with the yang impulses. How? How do we do that? Now, this is going to be a review. Forgive me if, I've ins- if I'm about to insult your intelligence. That is not my intention. How, what is the yin approach to dealing with, with the most virulence of young, patriarchal, destructive impulses that stalk the corridors of our heart? We non-conceptually and vulnerably practice awareness and acquiescence, which in turn gives birth to centered spontaneity from the place of centered spontaneity at the right time, the right words, the right choice, the right actions will flow out unstoppably like a sneeze whose time has come. That, that is how we bring harmony between yin and yang. Ordinary men hate solitude. Now that is not weakness. That is neurology. Over the, over the millions and millions and millions of years that life has been evolving on this planet. Natural selection or evolution has selected for cooperation, especially in species such as us, which lack fang, claw, and strength and speed when compared to our, the other living beings with whom we share this planet. Co- natural selection, our evolution selects for cooperation because that is how a slow, weak species of mammals such as ourselves have survived, no less thrived as completely as we have. And therefore, along those lines, we have incredible endocrinological punishments when we fail to cooperate, when we fail to commune with our fellows. And on the opposite hand, we have tremendous endocrinological rewards 
when we do cooperate and when we do commune with our fellows. So our bodies, our brains have evolved to select for socialization. So when we feel physical or emotional pain in the absence of suitable companions, that is not a mental illness, that is not weakness, that is evolution and biology and neurology and endocrinology functioning as an orchestra playing the overture to Mozart's marriage of Figaro. Now, that doesn't stop the fact <clears throat> that when circumstances do not support our desire to cooperate and commune with our suitable fellows, we feel pain physically, emotionally, profoundly. The young mentality would fight and rage and scheme and strive and cajole and somehow try to either fix what they're feeling or fix their circumstances. What, what, what would the yin path do? The yin path, as I've mentioned far too many times, the yin path would, produce, would continue to non-conceptually and vulnerably, vulnerably practice the awareness and acquiescence that give birth to patience, compassion, and the simplicity of centered spontaneity. That's a mouthful. Can I dumb it down? Oh, sure. Dumb is my niche. <laughs> We're not, we notice our circumstances and we acquiesce to it. We notice how we feel about our circumstances, non-judgmentally, neither praising nor condemning ourselves for feeling what we feel. We vulnerably notice, we passively notice what we are experiencing, and we acquiesce. And from our place of centered spontaneity, we flow from one adventure to the other be it subtle or coarse, internal or external, quiet or orchestral. Embracing his aloneness, realizing he is one with the whole universe now, of course, our young impulses say, but of course, I will realize my universal oneness. And to do that, I will use affirmations and I will write it out on a chalkboard a thousand times. I shouldn't do it. I'll, I'll make a t-shirt and I'll sell it. And we all can wear t-shirts proclaiming our realization of universal oneness. Oh, how splendid it all shall be. And that is not the path of yin. The path of yin does not aim to realize universal oneness. Universal oneness is the fringe benefit of those seven practices I just outlined for you. The visceral, sometimes non-conceptual realization of oneness and safety is the propitiation, the natural falling forward that comes from a lifestyle of awareness and acquiescence. My name is Lama Jigme Gyatso, and this is the Buddha Joy Meditation School. <laughs>